morning, everyone. Uh, I'm reading Luke 5, 1 to 11, and can be found on 1032 of the Church Bible. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Dasani, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats and one, and one belonged to Simon. He asked him to put it out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out to deep water and let down the net for a catch. Simon answered, Master, you work hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you have, say, you have said so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break, so they signaled for their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled two boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man, for he and all his company were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now you will, be, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Thank you, Bob, for doing that reading, and thank you, Betty, for those lovely prayers. So I'm going to invite Dean to come up, and uh, if you'll uh, join me in prayer for him. Lord, I give thanks for, for Dean, for the preparation he's put into this talk. I pray that through him your words will be felt by us all here, that we will have an encounter we talked about last week that, that through Dean's words we'll have an encounter with you, Jesus. I just pray that your words will, will pierce our hearts and our minds and have an impact on us today. Amen. Amen. Will you be pleased to know that this is a slightly lighter sermon than the ones that I've been delivered as of late? Um, so there's no need to hide beneath the chairs. <laughs> they have been slightly on the heavy side. This is a nice one. <laughs> They're all nice. Some are a bit more easier to swallow than others might be. Um, <laughs> okay, there's, a, there's a, quite a lot of things happening in today's scripture reading. And it's one of those scriptures where you can slowly read it and let your mind gently wander through the story. It's quite a visual piece of scripture. And you can use pieces of scripture like this to imagine yourself at the very scene. Perhaps you are one of the people in the crowd. The Gospels are very good at doing this because they are stories of actual events and people. There's a form of Ignatian prayer that encourages, encourages us to prayerfully meditate on pieces of scripture like this one and place us at the scene. This is called praying with imagination. And this is where we prayerfully ask God to open our senses, our minds, our ears, our smell, and our touch to what is going on in the scripture. And through our time of meditation, we open ourselves up to what God may be saying to us through the passage. This technique is very good. It's, very, it's a very good way in helping us not only to spend time in God's presence, but also to hear, help us hear what he is saying to us. 
It's also very good at helping, a um, very helpful method of bringing scripture alive in our minds and our hearts because they come real. So why not have a go at this? And I was just thinking about this earlier, perhaps the, um, I say John 2, verse 1 to 11, the wedding of Cana may be a good example. So basically what you do is you, you perhaps read the scripture and then you just pray, invite God to take you through that scripture with you and perhaps read it slowly and spend some time perhaps closing your eyes as you pause and allow God to open up that scripture in your mind and your heart. So why not spend time lingering and watching and hearing the story unfold before your mind's eye? Okay, let's dive into this scripture and let's picture the scene in our own minds. So what's happening? What's going on in this story? So as I'm going through this, you might just want to kind of, let's say, close your eyes, but just imagine yourself at the scene. What's taking place? Jesus is standing by a lake. Can you picture the lake? It's probably sunny. And it would almost certainly have been warm, if not hot. So you might want to feel that temperature. The sun's out. There's a big crowd surrounding Jesus, expecting, uh, expectantly listening to what he's going to say. They were expectant and excited. Can you visual, visualize this crowd of people? <clears throat> people are jostling and trying to get closer to Jesus. It was also probably a bit smelly as people were perspiring in the hot sun. People may have been traveling around Jesus for a few days. Are you one of the people in the crowd? Are you one of the smelly ones? I thought so. Picture Jesus looking around the scene of people before him, or the bustle and jostling and then he turns and notices two empty boats near the water's edge and some fishermen who are cleaning their nets. So what does he do next? He climbs into one of the boats and calls Simon, Simon Peter, over and asks him to put out a little from the shore. Jesus knows exactly what he is doing. He is very practical. He's a skilled teacher. He knows that sound carries very well over water and people will be able to hear him much more clearly from the boat. It would also stop him from being jostled while he speaks. So, Jesus sits down in the boat and begins to speak. In this piece of scripture, it doesn't recall what Jesus is saying. And that's because it's probably not the main point of this story. I wonder what Simon Peter felt at this time. He had been up all night fishing and hadn't caught anything. He is tired. <clears throat> He's doing a mundane and boring job. He's cleaning nets. And Jesus asks him to pitch his boat a few yards from the water's edge and keep the boat in that position. So you might want to imagine Peter with his oars in his hands and he's having to just gently keep the boat in that position. And Jesus is speaking to the crowd. What's the expression on Peter's face like? Don't you think it's interesting that Jesus catches Simon at this time doing a typical, normal, mundane, everyday activity in his everyday life? We too can have 
we too can meet and have encounters with Jesus in, in those routine, mundane, mundane jobs. You know, we had a, there was a men's breakfast. Someone gave a talk and that he was a postman. And she goes on long walks, hands post to people. And yet he was open to what the Lord was saying to him. You can be at all sorts of areas in your life and the Lord can meet us there. Are we open to such encounters in our own lives? Why not invite Jesus into those times and activities also? Let's keep our eyes open to what our Lord is doing in the things around us. You will meet him. And like Reverend Tim Ball said last week, let's be expectant to meet Jesus. And in a way, that's about help asking the Lord to open our eyes we get in our little routine. We tend to put one foot in front. I'm just thinking about myself here. You put your foot in front of the other. You get up in the morning, have your breakfast. You go through all the activities and the work. You come home. You cook a meal. And if you're lucky, you can kind of collapse on the sofa. I remember you're sleeping about 10 minutes. And, um, you know, that, and then you start again the next day. But we can actually meet the Lord throughout that journey of that day. So let's, imagine, let's invite the Lord into those little... That's why praying at the beginning of the day is quite important. Asking the Lord to open our eyes, where we're going to meet him. Let's look for those little opportunities. This isn't Simon Peter's first encounter with Jesus. His brother Andrew introduced him. Sorry, his brother Andrew introduced Simon to Jesus not that long back. Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist, and on one of those days, he then started to follow Jesus. And Jesus noticed this and invited him to spend some time with him. And you can catch that story in John 1:40. So Andrew told Simon that he'd found the Messiah, and Simon went with Andrew to see this Jesus for himself. Isn't that an amazing thing to do? Andrew had spent time, some time with Jesus, and had clearly enjoyed this experience, that he wanted to share, share this with his brother, Simon. He wanted him to know Jesus also. Isn't that something that we are asked to do as well? That's why spending time with Jesus is so important. We get to know him and experience his presence in our own lives. And this begins to bubble out of us, that we want to share it with those who are important to us also. And that's basically what it means to bear witness to Jesus. So let us share our experiences and encounters of Jesus with those who are important with us also. Let's start to keep our eyes open to what Jesus, our Lord, is doing around us, especially in the boring, mundane things. So what happens next? Well, Luke 5, 4 says the following. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Peter had been working all night. He had been busy and yet he had caught nothing. Being, work, being busy and working hard doesn't always mean that we are effective. And there's probably not a single person in this church who doesn't know what that means. You know, sometimes we can rush around like mental things and be really un unproductive. And sometimes it's like that. But Jesus told Simon to put out into deep water. So what was Simon's response? He says, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught, any, caught anything. Jesus the carpenter is telling Simon, the experienced fisherman, where to drop his nets. And sometimes we think we're such experts that we can't be told anything by anyone. And this often affronts our egos. As Martin Luther, the German theologian, 
whose writings inspired the Protestant Ref uh, Reformation said. I would have said, Martin says, I would have said, now look here, master, you are a preacher and I'm not undertaking to tell you how to preach. And I am a fisherman and you need not tell me how to fish. He goes on to say, but Simon was humble and therefore Jesus made him a fisher of men. Are we open to new ideas and fresh thinking from those around us? Or are we simply going to kind of dismiss suggestions from others out of hand? Are we humble enough to listen and consider what others may have, may have to say? Even if we are the experts. Simon's response to Jesus was the right response, he says. But because you say so, I will let down my net. Okay, how about Christchurch? I think this verse 4 and 5 are quite important to us. This putting, put out into deep water and let, let down the nets for a catch. This is the, the kind of the verse that really sort of jumped out at me. Where is Jesus asking Christchurch to drop our nets? That is the key question. Where is Jesus asking Christchurch to drop our nets? Now, I don't have the answer to this question, but I am sure that he will be telling us where, where to do so in the near future. And because I think, because of this, I think that it's important as a church that we seek the Lord for the answer to this question. This is about Christ Church moving forward corporately, but also each one of us individually. He may be saying to you, I want you to put your nets down here. So it may be a good idea if each one of us at Christ Church and also at Christ Church corporately spend time in today's scripture, perhaps reading and listening to what our Heavenly Father is saying to us and asking us to do. Perhaps this is something that could be picked up in the ministry leadership team and perhaps the Sunday intercession meetings. For us, dropping our nets into deep water is an act of faith. And it was an act of faith for Simon Peter. Are we, are we going to respond to Jesus' invitation like Simon did? Because you said so, I will let down my nets. Shall I think, I hope... Yeah, I'm just thinking about areas of my own life. I don't think I've always been quite as prompt as that. Um, that is a confession. This is going to take some time. We need to spend time with Jesus in prayer, listening. And I know as a church, and I say this really gives me great encouragement for the future, I think we are doing that. I think there's been a real big movement, and I've said this a couple of times, and you know, I think we, we are learning to listen. And the Lord is teaching us how to listen, how to wait, not to just jump in. And I think that's just, I think that's a real amazing thing that's sort of been taking place over the last sort of 12 months. It's going to take time. We need to discern and understand what God is saying specifically for us to do and where and when. And then ultimately, we need to step out in faith and obedience. Okay, looking at what, let's look at what happened next in the scripture reading. So Peter cast down his nets. What happened next? Verse 6 and 7. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. Now, I don't know what being obedient to Jesus' invitation looks like for us at Christ Church, so I'm not promising anything. So I'm not saying what that straining net looks like. I don't know the answer to that. That's why we need to pray. But what I do know relates to perhaps a previous sermon I delivered in October and November, and that was about feeding the 5,000. And, and the scripture that really sort of jumped out at me at that point was Jesus' conversation with Philip about where shall we buy bread for these people? 
Now, John 6, 6 said, he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. This is one of the things I kind of real feel quite, um, keep on being reminded over. I'll just read that last bit again. For he, Jesus, already had in mind what he was going to do. We can be confident in this. Jesus knows exactly what he is doing at Christ Church already. He already knows that. Do we believe this? Do we trust our Lord Jesus that he knows what he's doing? Remember, he's the Lord God Almighty. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere. He knows what he's doing. The, the next thing that happened after Simon was, Simon was obedient to Jesus is recorded in verses 8 to 9. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at, his, at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he knew, sorry, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. He goes on to say, Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. And when we have encounters with our Lord Jesus, we are never the same again. It doesn't mean that we somehow become perfect, but we do grow in faith and maturity. Spending time with Jesus often makes us aware of our own shortcomings, our sinfulness. But Jesus says, don't be afraid. That's what he said to Simon. Don't be afraid. He works with us as we are. Again, that 2 Peter 3 passage. Jesus is patient with us. And sometimes I think we just forget that. We forget just how patient he is. He knows exactly what we're like, our shortcomings, as well as our good things. And he knows we're going to stumble and fall over and get it wrong but he is patient with us. And we know that, look, he was patient with Simon Peter. And as you read the Gospels, you discover that Jesus needed to be patient with Simon Peter. So let's draw this sermon to, the, to a close. There's just a couple of little action points, really. Um, try praying with imagination through the Gospels. Perhaps don't rush through it, but start to imagine yourself at the scene in the Bible and invite the Lord to guide you through that time with him. Number two, let's have some of that enthusiasm for Andrew that when he shared his, ex his experience of Jesus with his brother, Simon Peter. And that comes out of the fact that we've spent time with him also. The more time we spend with Jesus, the more our expectant eyes are open to him and the more we will see and experience him in our own lives. And out of those real experiences will come opportunities to share with others the experiences we, ha we have had. Now, it's interesting because this was very much, it really echoes, I think, some of the sermons we've had as of late and I wrote this before I heard Tim Bell's, um, Tim Ball's um, sermon. It was, I wrote it last Saturday. And then he delivered that, that very amazing sermon last week. And again, it really is echoing about experience and spending time and, and then sharing that with others. I think the Lord is probably asking us to do that. And I think, again, I think Josh was very good at cause having that pause time during the service. Just to be still, just waiting. Let's just listen. And I think we all meet him in those gaps, in those silences. 
And three, let's be humble enough to listen to those around us when they give advice, even if we are the experts. Let us pray individually and corporately as a church and ask, where is the Lord telling us to let down our nets? Now, it may be that we don't really know until we get a new vicar, and that may be part of their calling, but we can be least praying about that, perhaps being open to what the Lord is saying. He may be telling us something before then. I don't know what he's going to do. He does. And we the big one at the end. Let's, let's also pray that the Lord will astonish us. Wouldn't that be amazing? That he would astonish and exceed our limited and small expectations in his plans for each of us individually and as a bride of Christ. There's such a good um, youth, young person song, you know, our God is a big, big God. I think the theology of that is just so amazing. And sometimes because God doesn't act immediately, perhaps because we're not ready for him, and sometimes we think, oh, he's only going to do little things or he's not going to do anything. I think we try, our God almost becomes small and so does our expectations. But actually he's really big. And so let us pray that God will astonish, astonish us. Kind of have a wow moment. But he could just astonish us in really little small things. It doesn't have to be kind of earth shattering. Sometimes it's those little personal things and the Lord has spoken into our lives or he's done something, small things. And often we can be really astonished by that. Let us choose to be obedient to Jesus, like Simon Peter was, to our own sort of loving bridegroom. I'm just going to pull that together and just pray. Father God, over the last couple of weeks, the word has been really about, even this morning, about meeting with you having experiences of you, Lord. I, Lord, teach us how to do that. We pray that you, by your Spirit, would open our hearts and our eyes and our minds to you, Lord. May our eyes be really attentive and looking to where you're at, what you are doing. Help us to notice the things that you're involved in. You know, you are involved in so many things that we don't even notice. Open our eyes, Lord, by your spirit and our hearts. And Lord, we pray that we would be astonished as a church. Not in a very boastful way, but yeah. I pray, Lord, that you help us to... May you not be small in our own sight. We pray for Lord. May you exceed our expectations. And Lord, we pray that by your Spirit, our encounters with you would bubble over and we would, we couldn't not help but share it with those around us. Lord, we just give you thanks. We thank you that we are yours, we are your, we are Christ's brothers and sisters, but we're also our Heavenly Father's children. We thank you that we are your children and that you love us and that you take care of us and you provide for us. Father, we just glorify you and we just glorify you and say, come, come and have your way with us, Lord. As, ch as your children, teach us your ways. That we may just sing your praises forever and ever. Amen.